Well, here we are again. Uh, the Kingdom of God is Like, that's the name of our series. Uh, lesson number four, entitled The Power of Proclamation. The Power of Proclamation. Uh, Matthew 28, uh, verses one to 20. We'll uh, be talking about that a little, uh, little later on. I want to talk about the, the various uh, gospel and gospel writers. Uh, each of the uh, four men who recorded the life and the ministry of Jesus, uh, each of these men had their own perspective and objective in mind when assembling his uh, eyewitness account of the life and the death and the burial, the resurrection and then ascension of uh, Jesus. For example, John's gospel is the most philosophical of the four uh, gospels. Uh, and he uses a lot of imagery. You know, Jesus is the light, for example. And he does this to convey the concept that Jesus was the embodiment of the truth. Uh, Mark, uh, on the other hand, presents Jesus as the powerful son of God, devoting much of his account to describing 18 of the 35 miracles recorded the most of any of the gospel writers, uh, although he has a very short book. Uh, Luke is interested in showing uh, Jesus, the Son of God, as fully human and, and doing so by grounding his gospel record in precise history uh, and the social and religious customs of the Jewish nation. And then Matthew's unique perspective is to prove that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah according to the scriptures. And he does so in two ways. Uh, first of all, uh, by proof texting much of Jesus' life and ministry uh, to the passages in scripture that described and foretold what the Messiah would say and do when the Messiah would appear. If you notice in Matthew, everything, well, not everything, but you know, many times Matthew says, as it is written, as it is written, he's always uh, uh, comparing, always connecting the things that Jesus is doing and saying to what the prophet said that the Messiah would do. Um, for example, there are 68 Old Testament references um, that Matthew states in making this point uh, about Jesus. And then secondly, Matthew is the only writer to specifically describe Jesus as a royal figure a promised king from David's lineage, the true king of the heavenly kingdom. And since this series is, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like, we've talked about the kingdom in the first uh, several uh, lessons. And in this final lesson, I want to talk about the king of that uh, kingdom. So for this reason, any study seeking to develop the biblical theme of the kingdom of heaven and various facets of that theme uh, that study needs to examine Matthew's account since his gospel is completely immersed in this imagery of the king and his kingdom. And so the title of this uh, lesson, as I mentioned before, is The Power of Proclamation. And it suggests that there are two things to consider. One, the power, and two, the, procla the proclamation. So uh, the title of the lesson, however, is The Power of the Proclamation, as I mentioned. And so one might ask, where is the power? I've heard the proclamation based on you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's writings, but how is this uh, proclamation, how is it powerful? You know, we talk about the power of the gospel. How is it uh, powerful? Is the power based on the eloquence of the speaker? Uh, is the power based on the amount of details given or the type of presentation, perhaps using images or song or drama or emotion? Well, the power of the proclamation is not found in the speaker or the style, but rather in the content of the proclamation itself, the content of the proclamation of the kingdom. All right? So we proclaim that Jesus, King of the kingdom, has achieved the victory over man's greatest enemy, uh, which is death. Uh, a lot of people say, well, the, the, you know, the, the enemy of man is sin. Yes, but the net result of sin is death. And so death is our great enemy, all right? 
Uh, we're trying to overcome sin in order to overcome death. And Jesus has done this on our behalf, which gives him the right uh, to be uh, the king of the kingdom. And so this victory has been witnessed, um, uh, this victory by Jesus, uh, has been uh, witnessed by hundreds of people, recorded and preserved in the Bible, and we have been given the task to proclaim this good news uh, to our generation uh, today. There is therefore power in the proclamation of Jesus' victory because the resurrection is the answer to every doubt and fear and failure and disbelief in this fallen world. For example, on October the 2nd, 2017, a man in, called um, Stephen Paddock traveled to Las Vegas and shot and killed 59 people and injured over 500 spectators who were attending a, a concert. And then he took his own life, the worst single shooter mass murder in American history. Immediately after the incident, politicians and lobby groups began debating things like gun control laws and people started to raise funds for the wounded and there were endless articles about how to prevent these types of uh, you know, shootings, uh, more counseling, better screening, more security at concerts. Uh, uh, in other words, how to prevent these needless uh, killings and death. Uh, no one, uh, however, uh, bothered to bring up the idea that death was not the issue. Because you see, everybody dies of something sooner or later. Whether you're killed at a concert or hit by a car or you die of old age, everybody dies. It's just a question of which, which thing, if you wish, uh, takes your life in the end. Uh, so uh, no one bothered to bring up the idea that uh, death was not the issue. The issue was judgment. In other words, what happens after I die? That's the issue. We know that there will be uh, something that happens. We know that there will be a judgment because the Bible says so. Uh, in Hebrews 9.27, the writer says, and inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment. So the problem with death is that there's a judgment that comes right after it. We now have confirmation of this with Jesus' resurrection, which among other things affirms as true all the things that are written in the Bible. So we know that there is a judgment that comes after, after death. And we know this because God's word tells us this. And we know God's word is true and can confirm it because Jesus, uh, 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 the one who brought us God's word, uh, uh, died and resurrected from the dead. And that resurrection proves that what he taught and what he said, and what he gave us is uh, true. So the risen Christ declares that there will be a judgment and this truth cuts through all the tears and sorrow and clattering media noise surrounding this horrific event. And it speaks to the people involved in the following way. So I, I'm, I'm staying with my, uh, my example of this particular shooting here to demonstrate a few things. A few things that, that the, the death and resurrection of Jesus uh, means for the various people involved in this sh uh, shooting. For example, to the wounded and the witnesses who were scarred for life by this, well, to these people, you have a chance to reflect on your life, what's true and what's not true. You have been spared and you can still contemplate the resurrection and what it means for you in your future. You know, people who uh, come close to dying, like these people did, the survivors, the wounded, when, when you come close to dying, a lot of people say, you know, I just had a, a clear vision. You know, I had a clear vision of life. I began asking myself more important questions. Uh, I started to get my priorities straight. And most importantly, I realized that people actually die. I mean, we know this intellectually, but when you yourself almost die or someone near you is killed in an accident or worse in a, in a terrible shooting like this, 
you ask yourself important questions and you realize that, wow, dying is true. You know, that's why at funerals, uh, when I do funerals, you know, uh, people are always in a hurry for the funeral to be over, the guests anyways, so that they can get back to normal. You know, they start talking about baseball or the weather or something, not 10 minutes after the funeral, because they don't want to contemplate what has just taken place. They don't want to contemplate what, uh, what this means. You know, if that person's in the coffin, it means I'm going to be in the coffin too one of these days. Some people ask themselves important questions and the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus usually is contemplated during these moments when people are reflecting. Um, to the families of the individuals uh, that were uh, killed, if your loved one was in Christ, you have hope because Jesus' resurrection guarantees their resurrection and your resurrection as well when it time comes. You know, a lot of people who uh, don't believe, who have no faith, when someone dies, the best that they can hope for is, well, you know, I, I hope they're happy and uh, maybe they're up there looking down at me. They have no idea what happens after death. They have no idea of the judgment. They have no idea of what Christ has done. And like Paul tells them, for those who have no hope, they have no hope. But for believers, even though the death of a loved one is difficult, we have hope. We have the hope that that individual uh, will uh, live again uh, in Christ. And we have the hope that we also uh, will be with Christ uh, and, and, and with our loved ones uh, when that time uh, arrives. Uh, to, the, um, uh, to the shooter's family, uh, his brother uh, said that uh, he had no religious affiliation uh, and that he was not a man of faith. His passion was gambling, not God. Uh, he becomes an example of how wicked a person without Christ in this life can become and why Jesus died on the cross to begin with. Uh, he may have escaped justice here on this earth, but Jesus' resurrection guarantees that he will face God's justice when all men will be resurrected to be judged for their deeds done uh, in the body. We read in uh, Romans chapter two, verse 16, on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So the proclamation of Christ has not only, uh, uh, f excuse me, the proclamation of Christ has power rather, not only for the good news that it announces, but also for the answers that it provides for those who are hurt, those who are sorrowful, those who are frightened, as well as the warning of judgment to come for disbelievers and mockers and the wicked in this world. The proclamation of the gospel addresses all of these people and also addresses whatever situation that they may find themselves in. This, this shooting is the reason that we need to proclaim and keep proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom uh, until Jesus uh, returns, because it's the answer for all of the individuals who are affected uh, by, this, uh, by this shooting, and I use this as an example. Now, if you want to gauge how powerful the proclamation of the gospel is, try to imagine a world without this proclamation. In other words, try to imagine a world without the gospel. Imagine that for a moment. I think uh, we get a glimpse of a world without the proclamation of a powerful message from God where only a few people held fast to a promise of a future salvation. Uh, one of these periods, of course, was during the pre-Diluvian era of Noah, uh, where the Bible describes a society whose every thought was evil. Can you imagine that? You know, in Genesis uh, 6, 5, it says, uh, the attention of men's heart was continually evil. Can you imagine living in a society where it's all evil? There's no, there's no good, uh, no recognition of God, no knowledge of God, no promise of God. Noah lived in such a, a generation. I'm asking you, imagine if we had to live in that kind of generation today because 
uh, Satan is always at work trying to you know, uh, eradicate uh, any effort to, uh, to preach the gospel. And he's been successful in certain parts of the world. That's why we send missionaries, right? So that we can make that proclamation so that all can have uh, the hope uh, of eternal life through, through Jesus Christ. Uh, another time when, uh, you know, when uh, there was no gospel. Um, uh, the, this time was uh, during the king's dream, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream in the Old Testament that was interpreted by Daniel, who declared that the entire world would be ruled by pagan empires for over 600 years. Do you ever think about that? We're always amazed by the fact that Daniel, you know, uh, he, he predicted, he prophesied that there would be four empires, one after another, one overtaking the other, until during the fourth empire, the Roman Empire, you know, the kingdom of God would come. And we're always saying, wow, that's amazing you know, that he, he was able to do this. You know? God gave him the power to see into the future like this, so accurately, 600 years into the future. But did you ever think for a moment that those you know, four or 500 years, there would be no gospel. There would be no hope being preached uh, uh, to people. That the Jewish people, for example, were the only ones who were holding uh, together uh, the light of hope in the future based on uh, what, uh, what Daniel and, and others uh, were saying. And so the proclamation of a risen Christ you know, uh, is not designed to fix a broken world. Uh, th this, is the, you know, this is the promise of ideologues and politicians. You know, the ideologues and politicians always have a, an answer to fix everything. You know, it's, all, it's all going to be great. It's going to be heaven on earth if you elect me or if you follow this philosophy. Well, the proclamation's purpose is to call people out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. Um, Colossians 1 verse 13. That's what the proclamation is for. Christians are not here on earth to fix the world. We're not here to fix the social problems. We're here to call people out of the world. We're here to call people out of this place. The world is on fire and, and it'll be destroyed along with everything and everyone whose life is, is bound to it. If, you're, if your life is bound to this world, then it'll, <laughs> It'll be burned up along with this world. As Peter says concerning those who have been saved, that they have escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Second Peter chapter one, verse four. Note that on Pentecost Sunday, after Peter had finished proclaiming the good news of Jesus' resurrection, in Acts 2.40 it says, and with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them saying, be saved from this perverse uh, generation. What was, what was Peter saying? Well, he was proclaiming the gospel, okay? And he was proclaiming the gospel, and in doing so, what he was doing was saying to people, get out, come out of this world. You know, your house is on fire. <laughs> get out, save yourself. And that's what we are today. We proclaim the gospel. The gospel isn't there to, as I said before, to fix social problems. And we're not sending missionaries out to you know, restructure political uh, entities in, in other countries. You know, uh, the gospel's purpose isn't to bring democracy to different, uh, to different nations. The, the purpose of the gospel is to announce that the world is on fire, that the world is ready to be judged and destroyed. And those who uh, uh, hear the gospel, those who obey it, uh, are saving themselves uh, from this uh, eventual uh, judgment. And so, the, as I said, the proclamation's purpose is to call people out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God. Remember we said the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, in this lesson we're saying, why should you go into the kingdom? Well, because the kingdom of darkness is darkness and the kingdom of darkness uh, is being set for destruction. The world, as I said, is on fire and it'll be destroyed along with everything and everyone whose life is, is bound in it. And so the kingdom's victory is not that somehow we have won over the world or we've repaired what is broken or bent in the world, the victory is that those who were dead in sin 
now can be resurrected to eternal life when Jesus, uh, when Jesus returns. That's the victory. This message is powerful if we would only proclaim it. You know, the kingdom cannot be established unless we proclaim the message of the kingdom. The number one reason why churches are small and they remain small is not because they are in a small town or they, they don't have a full-time preacher or their building is not suitable. These are symptoms, not causes. The cause for non or very limited growth anywhere, not just here you know, in, 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 in Texas or Oklahoma or up north in the northern states, uh, is that we're not proclaiming. You know, a church that doesn't proclaim can't grow. Uh, proclamation is the most powerful tool that we have for growing churches. We have to find a, a, a way or a medium uh, that we have access to and that we can afford and we have to start proclaiming the good news. That's what I tell uh, churches everywhere when, you know, when we have a, a, a church growth uh, type of uh, seminar. Uh, and of course, there's a way that to organize the church in a proper uh, manner to, so that it'll function properly, you know, a ministry system and all that. And they have to have good teaching and uh, uh, you know, uh, attendance has to be uh, regular and, and enthusiastic. But in the end, if we want the church to grow, we have to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Act, we have to actually do it. A lot of times I go to uh, congregations that are not growing and they can't figure out why. And, and I ask the question of the deacons or the, the men's meeting or whatever, uh, I ask them, what is it exactly that you're doing to proclaim the gospel itself to the community in which your congregation is situated? Well, they say, well, we have services every Sunday. No, that's, 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 that's not good enough. That's, you're just pre preaching to the, to the faithful. Well, once a year we have a VBS and I'm saying, well, that's a good effort, but you do that just once a year? One time a year for a day or two, you have children come and hopefully you know, preach the, the gospel or make the proclamation to their parents once a year, and you're wondering why the church isn't growing? So the big question for the local church is always, what exactly are you doing to communicate to your community uh, the, the good news of the life and death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How are you getting that message to your community? Are, are you having a commercials on, on, on TV? Uh, are you passing out flyers? Um, do you have a billboard? Um, do you do door knocking? You know, find a medium that you have access to, that's what I meant and whatever you can afford and start proclaiming. How are we proclaiming Christ to our community is the question that we should ask ourselves, especially when it comes to church, uh, church growth. And all those who, uh, whose ministry is to go to various congregations and help them, uh, help them grow or uh, give them a hand, such as the, the, the sojourners, for example, uh, one of the messages that you need to bring to all of these congregations is that they have to begin proclaiming the gospel to their community. And, and you'll get all kinds of excuses. Well, everybody knows we've been here for 50 years. You know? they, I've heard one church tell me that. Well, we, our congregation has been here for 75 years. Everybody knows. And I, and I said to them, are you telling me that in 75 years nobody has moved in or out of your community or your town? that no one in your community or your town has had perhaps a change of heart, that no one in your community has grown up and, and now is an adult and is ready to hear the good news? Is that what you're telling me? That no one is ripe to hear the good news of Jesus? Uh, I, I, tell, I, well, I tell them about the, uh, uh, the pizza parlor uh, method. Uh, a guy opens a pizzeria you know, in the community and he wants to get the word out on his pizzerias. And so what he does is he sends out flyers. He doesn't just send out a flyer about his pizza and the various menu items and the special two for one on Tuesday or whatever it is. You know? He doesn't just send that flyer one time. 
he sends that flyer every three weeks or every month he sends a flyer out to the community. And, and, and what happens is that uh, at a particular house, you know, people are going to get the mail and they pick it up and they, they uh, hear the phone bill and uh, you know, the electric bill and uh, a pizza parlor place. Oh, look at that. Yeah, whatever. So you know, I'm not in the mood for pizza. And, uh, and it goes in the trash the first month and it goes in the trash the second month and the fourth month and the fifth month. And then one summer uh, day, uh, they're having a birthday party and, and they said, you know what, uh, you know, it'd be nice, the kids, let's have some pizza for them. And then all of a sudden, ding, it's like, where's that, where's that brochure that I get in the mail all the time about pizza? Where is that thing? Oh, here it is. That's, that, that's the thinking behind what I'm trying to, to get across here about the proclamation. We have to continue making that proclamation over and over and over and over again in our communities. Because at some point, uh, different people in the community will either realize that this is a message for them or they'll be new and, and, and they'll be looking for, uh, you know, looking for the gospel or they'll be looking for a, a, a church uh, to, to worship with. Uh, you know, the moment will be right. And after maybe the 15th time that they've received the flyer about your particular congregation, they'll go, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I ought to go visit these people. They sure are interested in, they're interested in me. They're committed to me. The power of the proclamation is that when someone finally, you know, is, is interested in reading it, it has an effect on them. Even if the first six times, you know, they, 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 they're not interested because they're too busy, quote, in the world, at some point their life is going to be on fire and they're going to be looking for help. And, 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 and the blessing is that if you have been reaching out to them, if you have been proclaiming to them on a regular basis, uh, then at some point in their life, uh, they're, going to, they're going to respond. Just remember one thing, the more the victory is proclaimed outside the church building, the more people will have inside the church building. The more we proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God outside of the church building, the more people eventually will be inside our uh, church building. And so that's the, uh, that's the end of our uh, series. Uh, I want to, to uh, thank you for your attention and pray that God bless you as you renew your efforts to proclaim the victory of Christ and to proclaim the good news of the kingdom uh, to your various uh, friends and neighbors and communities using whatever tools, whatever, you know, whatever access that you may have to the people around you. God bless you, we'll see you soon, bye-bye.